Okay, well, uh, welcome to this lecture on uh, time and uncertainty. We're not on time, and so I'm certain that I won't finish everything, but we'll uh, do the best we can here. Um, you've uh, already heard uh, many of the basic uh, principles of uh, economics, You're talking about ends and means, and about how uh, uh, people value things and establish preferences and uh, make choices and uh, engage in production and establish a uh, structure of production and what all the causal laws are involved in this sort of thing. And <laughs> this lecture is uh, designed to focus on uh, some of the elements that uh, often get bypassed in this uh, discussion. And one of the important distinguishing features of the Austrian view is that unlike the neoclassical uh, mainstream, we uh, take seriously these particular issues of time and uncertainty that we want these to be integrated into our uh, discussion, even though sometimes when we present these basic principles, it doesn't seem like we're really integrating or uh, at least focusing on time and uncertainty. <laughs> so that's what this lecture is designed to, z to do, and uh, just to uh, focus on these two ideas. Now, let's just start with uh, some of the very basic principles of time or about time. And the first of these you've heard already, this is that uh, action always aims at attaining an end in the future. That is, when we decide to act, we don't simultaneously attain the end. But we decide on the basis of the anticipation that we have of the realized value of the end. So there's an anticipated value of the end. This is what we base our decision to act upon. And then the realized value of the end, or again, the means, if we're valuing means, the realized value of the uh, end, <coughs> which, uh, which uh, comes only in the future, which we, uh, accrues to us uh, only after we act. <coughs> now, uh, time then involves, of course, uh, uncertainty, the uh, inability of us to, again, realize the value of the end when we decide to act. The, since these two things are disparate in time and because of other things we're going to talk about in a minute, mainly the uh, finitude of human nature, we're not able to perfectly anticipate what value will be realized from any particular end that we pursue. And because of this, the future is uncertain. And because of uncertainty, we know that we make errors. So the very concept of making an error follows from the existence of uncertainty. An error is simply being defined as the difference between uh, our anticipated uh, valuation and the realized valuation. The difference between what we expect to happen and what actually happens. This is an error. And then, uh, of course, the third thing that's uh, related in this cluster of concepts is the idea of entrepreneurship. Uh, if our action was uh, willy-nilly, that is, if uh, our experience with our own action was just that, well, it's a hit or miss thing that we succeed. Sometimes it just works out, and other times, it, well, it doesn't, and there doesn't seem to be any pattern that we notice or any consistency to which our actions are more or less successful, then we probably would not, would not conceive of the notion of entrepreneurship. But this isn't the way it is. When we think about our actions, it's just by and large, they tend to work out okay. It's not that you know, uh, they always work out perfectly or that any one of them works out perfectly. But there's a, there's a, uh, a tendency toward success. <clears throat> well, this seems to infer then that uh, we must have abilities as human beings, we must have skills that permit us to deal with this uncertainty. And it's this cluster of skills, the cluster of human traits that we refer to as entrepreneurship. And foremost among these is the uh, trait that we call foresight. Foresight, just referring to what I, the word I used before, of being able to anticipate um, how a future event will, uh, will uh, turn out. Now, I, I want to delay, though, Having introduced these notions, I want to delay just talking about uh, uncertainty. I want to set that aside and go back to some of the other basic um, inferences that we come to about time. So we're going to set aside uncertainty for the moment. Now going back to some of the uh, basic constructs of conceptual ideas with respect to time, uh, we know first of all we need to start with correct constructs of time. That is, as human beings, how do we conceive of time with respect to action? Mises is very clear at this. You know, there's, there's a very di uh, great difference between measured time, 
you know, time just clicking away one second after another, and time in a praxeological sense. These are two entirely different notions. And in fact, Mises defines the present as the period over which action occurs. The, the present then is a, can be a long extended period of time. The present is just the, that period of time to which we are aware of in our action. We're, we're aiming our action to fit into this particular time frame. This is the relevant notion of the present, as Mises conceives of it, as opposed to, again, just the moment that's ticking away, right? Where the, where the past is everything in the past and the future is every moment beyond this one that just went into the past. Okay, so that, that's not really so important for praxeology. Okay, so what are some of these concepts? I mentioned the present already, but uh, there's some others. Uh, Mises uh, defines the period of production. This would be one important praxeological notion about time. And the period of production, he says, is the time from the start of the action to the beginning of the attainment of the end. So that's the period of production. And as he points out, uh, conceptually at least, the period of production could have two parts to it. One, one he calls working time, and this is the stages of production, right? So we mine iron out of the ground, and then we refine it into steel, and then we pound the steel into a fender, and then we put the fender on an automobile. So that's the working time, the stages of production. Then there could be maturing time. One could take a productive act, and the effect that we wish to obtain from that act that, that helps us achieve our consumptive end uh, may, take, uh, may take this maturing time. Uh, the, the time it takes for a, a wine to mature would be a classic uh, example of this. But, but this could be true of other things, right? We engage in a productive act and then some time elapses before the effect is, uh, is made uh, realizable for us. Okay, so that's one idea, the period of production. Now, the second one is the duration of serviceableness, or what we might more simply call the durability of the good, the duration of serviceableness of the good that's produced. So this is defined as the uh, time over which the good generates services. It's useful life. <clears throat> now as Mises points out, these two ideas, these two basic ideas about time, the period of production and the duration of serviceableness, are uh, praxeological concepts that we must have in our minds when we act. When we, when we choose to act, we think in terms of these two concepts with respect to time. Uh, every action we take pays attention to these concepts, whether we're you know, uh, formally aware of it or not. Let's take this uh, simple kind of illustration. Um, let's say we have a guy and he's de deciding whether or not to build a new house, or to have a house built for him, himself. Right? So he's, you know, he's investigating this, finding out how much it might cost, and uh, you know, so on. And let's say uh, it's $200,000 to build the house, and then, as we suggested before, he has to establish a preference between what he thinks the value would be of the consumption services of the house relative to what he's giving up uh, in terms of other valuable ends that he could pursue with the 200000 But there's more to the, uh, preference, the establishment of a preference here than just that, right? There's more to just what's the sum, so to speak, of the uh, value of the good and the sum or the utility of the uh, value of the things given up. There's also these time considerations. Um, the $200,000, does he have to spend it all up front, for example, to build the house? How long does the house take to build? Does it take a year to build? Does it take 10 years? Is the $200,000 doled out evenly over the time period? Right? You know, like $10,000 a month and so on uh, over the uh, 20 months that it would take to build the house or whatever it is? Well, th this might change his mind, right? If it takes five years to build the house, he might decide, well, no, I don't want to. Uh, do that. But if it takes six months, oh, he, well, okay, that's okay. If he has to put the $200,000 up front, he may say no. If, he, if, if it's backloaded, right, where he just say he pays 50000 up front and then six months later when the house is done, he pays the other 150. well, that's a different thing, right? He, he'll value this differently. And the same is true about the house. If the house, if the value of the house depends upon the duration of serviceableness. It's just not, you know, it's not how much value it gives him each day. It's how many days does, does the value accrue to him? How much maintenance is required to continue uh, this, the giving of this value? Right? That has to be taken into account. In other words, how fast does it deteriorate? It's serviceable and it's deteriorate. So all of these, fact, you know, these, these complexities enter in once we recognize 
the existence of time. And every action considers this, right? There may be some actions for which this consideration is minimal, but, uh, but it has to be a part of the conceptual structure of uh, thinking about action. Okay, now the last, uh, last of these basic just terms that we use to define the concepts of action would be the period of provision. <coughs> and this Mises defines as the time over which a person, by acting, provides for the future. The period of provision. This is the time horizon, or the planning horizon, one might call it, that one has in acting, right? Um, let's say, uh, let's say uh, we have a young couple and they just have, let's say it's uh, Dr. Murphy and his wife and they, they have a newborn child and they may, be, they may already be gain, being engaged in like a 20-year planning horizon to put their child to college or something like this. This is, the, this is what Mises is referring to, the period of provision. So in every action will have its own period of provision. Right? It, it, this would differ from one action to the next. And this too is a chosen thing. As I say, we have some scope for uh, altering the period of provision with respect to the action. It might change the value of the action, but, it, but we, we have to choose this, right? It's part of the choice nexus uh, in acting. Okay, now the, the last thing I want to introduce just in the introductory uh, ideas about time is, uh, is this critical uh, point that Mises makes about how we assess our action in time. And he puts it this way, he says, when we think about our action in the flux of time, we think about it with respect to sooner and later. The key distinction, the key praxeological distinction about time is sooner and later. Now, notice this is much different than the way in which we uh, think about other aspects of our action, like labor or money or you know, means that we use in action. Time is much different uh, praxeologically than a means. Because when we think about a means in action, we think of allocating amounts of it. Right? We, uh, you know, again, go back to the house, I spend $200,000 to buy the house, or no, let's say just $180,000. Right? We, we have a certain amount of the means, and we say that amount is what I wish to devote to this end in combination with other means. But time, we can't do this, right? Time, we can't, we can't uh, sort of store up time and gather it up in our, in our possession and then allocate it to an action. You can't say, oh, you know, I need, uh, I need uh, 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 30 hours this day uh, to, you know, engage in my actions. So I kind of accumulate time and then, ex and then allocate it, expend it. As Mises puts it, time is an irreversible flux. It just continues on, right? It just every moment passes into the next. And we're not in a position as human beings to own time. We can't, we can't control the use of it as we do a means, and therefore we can't allocate it. <laughs> we can allocate with respect to it. This is the important thing, but we can't allocate time itself. Time is not a means. At least it, it, it lacks the, the fundamental characteristics of means that we spoke about before. That a means is, an, is a thing out of, uh, you know, a, a thing in our circumstances of action that we control the use of in acting, that we allocate. <clears throat> okay, well, if we can't, uh, if we can't allocate a means, then what, you know, so, I mean a time, if we can't allocate time, then why, why don't we just, what can we say about it with respect to valuing? Because I thought the valuing process, we said before, was a matter of choosing, establishing a preference and choosing. Allocating just means to choose, right? <clears throat> well, so, so the question is, is there any choice with respect to time uh, about an action? And the answer is sure. It is this choice between sooner and later, right? We can always choose between doing an action sooner or doing it later. We do have a, a, a choice parameter here. And we'll choose based upon valuing whether or not the action is better suited sooner or later, or when in time the action is best suited. Now this we might call economizing time. Because we're choosing with respect to a differing value of time as we, alloc as we allocate our action in time, either sooner or later. So it's perfectly reasonable to call this economizing time. Just like we economize a means when we allocate it toward the highest valued end, right? We're allocating the moment in time to the highest valued end. We're saying, if we devote this time to the attainment of this end, it will give us the greatest value. 
So, so this is so it's reasonable to use the word economizing here, even though again it's different than economizing means. Okay, so let me give you an example of this. Uh, my wife's birthday is August 18th, and so uh, today, uh, which is what August the uh, fourth, uh, <clears throat> I uh, I have no interest today in uh, throwing her a birthday party, or let's say on the day I get back, because it's silly, I guess, to put it that way, right? The day I get back. August 8th or whatever it is. So I get back and uh, no, the, why? Why is this so? Why, in other words, uh, do I uh, set this action in time on August 18th? And the answer is because the same action, you know, taking the you know, having the cake and inviting friends over and giving presents and so on, the same set of action has much more value on that day than on other days, right? I prioritize. This is what I'm doing. I prioritize my actions in time. Every action, it's possible that any particular action would have a greater value if placed in time at a particular point. And if it does, then, then this is a choice possibility, right? You can always say, oh yeah, I, I think it would be better to postpone this action, so to speak, until later and place it in that, in that, in that particular time frame. Yeah. So I can understand that. He's always saying basically that I'm spending time no matter what, I get. there's no saving it or anything. I'm spending right. it. Well, so how do I allocate how I want to spend yeah, but I think, time? I think Mises' uh, claim is even more dramatic than that. I think he would say that the notions of spending and saving and anything that's related to the idea of allocating simply doesn't apply to time. I mean, we can talk this way. It's sort of metaphorically okay to talk this way. But strictly speaking, time stands outside of that kind of uh, conceptual framework it has its own principles that, that we must recognize. This would be his his position. You know, maybe again he's wrong about this. We can have a discussion later. But but again, this is his uh, his view. I, I I personally don't see that he's wrong in this. Well, I might also say that Rothbard does, Rothbard's ambiguous on this. He read Man, Economy, and State. Remember, he he says time is a means, and he does sort of talk about time being allocated and so on. So. Yeah, well, uh, okay, so, uh, yeah, we, I, I could take another real quick question. I don't, I mean, I don't know what kind of way it is, but I don't know if it's a mathematical way, it's a mathematical Well, one might think that it's better, uh, again, Mises would put it this way, he would say, Let's imagine we have a given end. We're going to, in fact, get to this point next, I guess. Mises <laughs> would say, let's imagine we have a given end that we want to satisfy. It would be better, he says, this, for us. Other things the same. Let's, this is a thought experiment kind of proposition. Other things the same, it would be uh, more valuable for us to attain that end sooner in time. The nearer to us we can draw it in time, the better. If we could compress it, if we could compress the amount of time that it takes to complete this end, to, toward the present, that would be better. And again, you, you could, you, maybe that's a, sort of the same thing as what you're saying. But I think it, uh, I think it's somewhat helpful not to mix the languages, right? Because he, he's really saying something different. In other words, he's, you can't really compress time, right? All you can do is just kind of, kind of move the attainment of the end closer to you. You're not, you're not really doing the same thing that you would be doing in other circumstances, what, like you're working more vigorously or something. Uh, but anyway, maybe this is just a semantic uh, question. Okay, so this gets us to the uh, principle of time preference. This is the second way in which we value time. So again, we value time or we value with respect to time in two ways. We economize time, we prioritize our actions, we set them in a time frame. And then the second way is time preference. Now, time preference, uh, Mises defines this way. He says it's the satisfaction of an end sooner is preferred to the same satisfaction later. And this is a thought experiment, right? We're holding the the, uh, sat the utility, the satisfaction, the same. We're saying just kind of in the abstract, if it's possible for us to acquire a given satisfaction a week from today relative to today, then what would our preference be? And, our, and he says our preference would always be for the present. Our preference would always be for sooner. He's not saying, of course, that we could always do that, right? My birthday party example would be a counter case. I can't, I can't, if I bring that sooner in time, I lose the value of it. That's why I don't do it. 
And so that, that isn't uh, illustrative of uh, time preference. Right? Time preference is this thought experiment claim. <clears throat> anyway, so what, uh, what argument does he give in favor of this? He says, well, if this weren't true, if, if we didn't have time preference, then it would be possible for us as human beings to say that there's some uh, uh, ends that are not uh, that are never too remote to aim at. In other words, we would have infinite periods of provision. That would be possible if we didn't have time preference. But of course, we don't, right? In fact, he he claims that every time we act, that action is a demonstration of time preference because the action itself brings the end closer to us in time. If we always preferred the action, the you know, the end to be attained somewhere more distant in time, then we would never act. The very fact that we act demonstrates time preference, in this sense, at least. Uh, that's Mises' claim. <coughs> okay. Now, uh, it, it would follow from this, of course, that it's just a uh, nonsense statement to to uh, say that there could be something like negative time preference. Right? Time preference isn't like a uh, a uh, scale uh, where it could be positive or negative. Uh, the only possibility besides time preference, it's, that's why we don't talk about positive time preference, right? That, that's just, it's redundancy to do that. It's just time preference. You either have time preference or you could not have time preference. That would be a conceivably possible state of affairs. But to have no time preference at all, that is to not prefer sooner as opposed to later, would mean that we would be perfectly satisfied or at least anticipate a perfect satisfaction of all of our actions forever into the future. I mean, as long as we live into the future. And, but if that were the case, of course, there would be no more action left for us to do. No more choice, no more valuing, no more nothing. We would just, we would just go through the activities that we had already pre-planned as best suited for the attainment of our ends. So that's a world of no action uh, at all. At least this is, again, how Mises uh, argues about this. Now, he further says, uh, because he doesn't want to leave this in the abstract realm of just satisfaction, he says, well, let's consider then what time preference would mean for goods. Uh, let's say, again, that we had, uh, we had uh, no, uh, well, we had you know, negative time preference. We preferred future goods to present goods, future, let's say, consumer goods to present consumer goods. And then, of course, if this were the case, we would, we would never consume. Every time tomorrow came, we'd still have the same preference for the future consumption of the good, and we would never consume. But clearly we consume, and so this must demonstrate that not only do we have a sort of an abstract uh, uh, time preference for a given satisfaction, but we also have a concrete time preference that's manifested for particular goods. We take a good and we, we actually act with it, we consume it, right? Uh, of course, this just follows from the basic uh, principle that all uh, all means have value from the ends to which they're put. So I mean, this just uh, follows uh, directly. Uh, but what about the case of no time preference? Maybe, okay, so we've shown that we can't have, so to speak, negative time preference. But what about the absence of time preference? Well, we have no uh, particular uh, preference for sooner versus later. Well, if this were true, then, of course, uh, we wouldn't engage in any production of present consumer goods as long as it were possible to have production processes that would be, give us more consumer goods in the future. All of our factors of production would be devoted to investment, in other words, building up capital so that we could get more consumer goods in the future. This is because more goods are preferred to fewer, right? More, that's the second law of utility. More is always preferred to less. And therefore, if we didn't have time preference, we, again, we would engage in no productive activity toward immediate consumer goods or toward near to us in time consumer goods, as long as production processes of greater length were more productive. And in addition, of course, we would, for any particular good that we would produce, we would always choose the longest, most productive process. Always, right? Because more of a good is preferred to less if we don't have time preference. But again, we don't do this. We engage in short production processes, sometimes even if they're not as productive as the long ones. And this can only be explained by time preference, or Mises would say the explanation for this is, is time preference. <coughs> uh, now, he's also quick to point out that uh, uh, time preference, uh, as he conceives of it, is not, uh, is not a psychological principle. It's not to be confused with psychological dispositions, like uh, impatience or uh, the pain of waiting or something like this. We may or may not have these particular psychological dispositions, 
the time preference isn't related to those. Uh, those things might change our degree of time preference, but they don't change the fact of time preference, right? Time preference exists whether or not we're just impatient people or whether or not we're, uh, you know, we feel uh, discomfort when we wait and so on. Uh, it, he also points out that it's not physiological. In other words, time preference doesn't have anything to do per se with our physiological needs. You know, that we have certain present needs that have to be met. We have to eat every day and hydrate ourselves and, and so on. As Mises points out, even for these ends or actions designed to attain these ends, we still judge them with respect to time preference. Right? We, still, we still anticipate them with respect to sooner and later. <coughs> uh, and even when all of these ends are met, we still have time preference, right? And, and so it doesn't seem that this has anything to do with it. Okay, now in, in this uh, chain of reasoning, the next thing that Mises points out is, a, uh, is an empirical premise. Uh, and this premise is that goods with the shortest period of production, the short, short periods of production are like uh, picking apples off a tree. The stages of production are short in time. But they're, you can get your end uh, rather immediately. The goods with, goods with the shortest period of production fail to satisfy all ends. Mises said this is just an empirical fact about the world. The world might be different than this, but it isn't. Okay? All of our ends are not met with immediate, sh sh as short as possible, periods of production. <clears throat> okay, so this is the, he says, if this is true, then if this empirical uh, uh, feature of reality does in fact exist, then time preference implies certain things. It implies, for example, that longer production processes must always be more productive than shorter ones. In other words, we would never choose a longer, less productive production process as opposed to a shorter, more productive one. Right? We'll always choose the shortest, most productive one. So any longer production process has to be of greater productivity. And as he points out, there could be two ways in which longer processes could be of greater productivity. One would be that the process would give us greater a greater amount of the goods that we could produce with a shorter process. So we have an apple orchard and uh, you know, we just go out and hand pick the apples and we get a certain amount of productivity as the immediate production process and so on. But then the alternative would be that we invent some kind of a, a capital good that permits us to pick the apples. I don't know if such a thing exists. I don't know anything about apple production. but you know, so. Well, we could change the example to make it more reasonable, I guess. But, but it's something like this, right? Uh, maybe we can engage in a capitalized, uh, mechanized process that picks the apples more, more uh, 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 proficiently. So we get more output with a given, uh, with a given production process. As he points out, then this would be a candidate for this would be one possibility. We, we might choose then to mechanize here, right? We might choose the longer production process. It would depend upon the extent of our time preference. But that would be one possibility. Uh, then the other case, is that, as I said, was that um, you, might, uh, you might be able to, with a longer production process, produce goods that you cannot produce with a short production process. Some goods you simply cannot produce with a short process, right? You can't produce a computer. You can't produce an automobile. These of necessity require a long uh, or a longer process of production. So here you're choosing between apples or you know, wheat or something like this that you can sort of immediately produce out of nature, and an entirely different good that you have to engage in this long production process for, but you value that good more, uh, relatively speaking, than the value of the uh, good that you give up. So that would be the second possibility. And obviously the second possibility is more germane to the modern economy than the, than the uh, first. <coughs> okay, now the second implication that he, that he draws from this empirical fact that goods uh, with the shortest production uh, periods uh, fail to satisfy all the ends, is that uh, people then will already have, in any moment in time, people will have already selected all of the most productive, shortest production processes. Those would be the most preferred, right? We, we, would, we would already immediately put into use every short, productive, you know, a highly productive production process. That means that the only thing left to us, the only additional things that we can do, are longer, more productive production processes. We would also, of course, have longer, less productive processes available to us, but we would never choose those. 
I mean, maybe by mistake, right, but ne never intentionally choose those. So notice what follows from this is something important about business cycle theory uh, uh, and, and uh, capital accumulation, which is that capital accumulation and, and thus by extension the boom process in the business cycle, which mimics capital accumulation through malinvestment, is always a lengthening of the structure of production. Right? It lengthens it out. It draws it out in time. This is of necessity because every time we engage in additional capital accumulation, it must be in longer production processes. <clears throat> now, of course, there could be, uh, one, one might say there could be sort of accidental exceptions to this, right? At the very time when we engage in more capital accumulation, somebody invents a more, a more uh, a productive, shorter process. That, in sure, people would rush to implement that. But Mises's point is just about the logic of the case, right? Given that we've exhausted all uh, feasible production activity, the only things open to us are longer, more productive processes. And so capital accumulation must follow that line. It must, it must follow along the lines of longer uh, t uh, capital structures. <coughs> OK, now uh, the next thing that uh, Mises points out about, <coughs> about time preference is that uh, because time preference is a fundamental praxeological concept, Mises even makes the somewhat startling claim that animals have time preference. Okay, so I mean, this is somewhat more fundamental then than even the notion of preference itself, which only human beings have. Right? Animals don't choose according to their uh, subjective valuations. At least we have no evidence that they do this. Right? We think this applies only to human beings. But Mises claims that time preference even applies to animals. Even animals act, uh, you know, or behave. I guess I should say, uh, behave uh, with with the aim of present, as opposed to delaying and acting later into the future. Now again, maybe Mises is wrong about this, but the point is that he considers, uh, he considers time preference uh, apodictic, irrefutable. You don't, there's, no, there's no way you can, uh, there's no example of realizable human behavior that you could ever give that contradicts it. In any more than you could give an example of human behavior that contradicts preference. These are basic fundamental concepts by which all human action is understood. Right? Let me give you an example with preference, since we've already dealt with that. Oftentimes, I use this kind of uh, kind of provocative example with my students, just so they just so they at least have a have the opportunity to understand this point. Because uh, to the to just the normal person, you know, who, who isn't who isn't uh, versed in economic jargon, uh, the word preference just means my taste, my, what I like and what I don't like, right? And so it seems easy, if that's the case, if you just think of preference in that sense, that uh, sometimes people act uh, in, in ways they don't like. They can act against their preferences, right? They can be, uh, their parents can make them do things that they don't want to do, or so on. Or they can even choose to do things that they don't prefer to do in that sense. And so the example I give them is a smoker. Smokers often say this, right? They say, oh, I wish I could kick this filthy habit. Right? And so they think, so, so it kind of draws to their mind that this is really a, a contradiction of the notion of preference. And that's where, you know, so, so I explain to them, no, 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 what we mean by preference is simply that the person values things in such a way that he chooses to act in the way that he does. That's what preference means. So his action can never contradict his preference. Right? Preference is just what we mean by, uh, or the word we use to refer to the judgment of value by which he decides to act in the way that he did. So he prefers to smoke. That, okay. Okay. So the same thing would be true about time preference. That would be the basic point to make uh, with respect to uh, alleged exceptions to time preference. Now let's go through a couple of examples that Mises uh, cites. Uh, one is the uh, we have a guy who uh, is presented with two theater tickets to two different shows, uh, but they're for the same night. And he, he throws up his hands and he says, oh, I wish, you know, uh, I wish uh, the uh, uh, production of Hamlet was available tomorrow night. So some say, well, this is a, see, he's preferring the future good, right? He's preferring the future over the present. So this contradicts time preference. And as Mises points out, of course, there's nothing of the sort, right? The person is deciding between two present options. He doesn't, he doesn't have the option of uh, of the future consumption of the good, right? That's not part of his circumstance of acting. It's just the wish that he, his wishes that it were available to him. 
So no, this is just a standard choice between two options, both of which he can't uh, act towards simultaneously. He can only choose one, and he chooses what he values most, and he, and he foregoes the other. Uh, the, the, then, there's a, then there's a block of cases, a, which we might put under the heading of different goods, because that's a standard Austrian retort to those who say that these are exceptions of prime, uh, time preference. The retort is, no, these are different goods. Remember, time preference only, only refers to a given satisfaction. Uh, and the classic case of this is ice in winter and ice in summer. So a person, you know, in the winter time, a person says, oh, ice is much more valuable to me in the summer. You know, I, let's say ice to make a nice tea or something. That, that ice is more valuable to me in the summer, six months from now than it is now, right? Okay, I'm, is he preferring a, a future good? I mean, it seems like this is a contradiction of time preference, or some make it out to be a contradiction of time preference. Now, uh, let's run through the possible ways in which we would reconcile this. Remember, we're not trying to reconcile this action with time preference in order to somehow, you know, uh, kind of rationalize our position on time preference. We've already said that time preference is apodictic. I mean, we can either reject that argument or, you know, on, on some kind of logical grounds or not. But if, but if time preference is apodictic, then, the, then this sort of situation has to be explained somehow else, right? It can't be a contradiction of time preference because there isn't such a thing. Uh, well, so anyway, uh, uh, one, one uh, point would be this. Maybe it is that this person who values ice in the summer uh, more than in the winter is intending to use ice in the winter as a complementary good in, in, in a production process to get him ice in the summer. Maybe he's storing up ice in the winter in order to get it in the summer. I, I realize this is un somewhat unlikely. But, this, but there might be other examples where this is, in fact, what's being done. If that's the case, of course, well, then it's no exception at all, right? The, the, the value of the end, the value of the consumer good is always greater than the value of the factors of production. And so we wouldn't have a case of a violation of time preference. <coughs> uh, another possibility would be that the valuation, that the circumstances are different in the winter than the summer. And one of the circumstances that might affect the person's valuation is his stock of ice. He might just have a lot of ice in the winter. And therefore, because of diminishing marginal utility, he just doesn't place very much value on in, you know, a couple of cubes of ice. Whereas in the summer, he doesn't have very much ice, and so because of diminishing marginal utility, he places a greater value on a given amount of it. Maybe that's the explanation. Or a more likely one, of course, would be that the uh, uh, th that there are other circumstances besides the stock of ice that create this difference. I mean, after all, drinking a glass of ice, ice tea on a hot summer day on your deck is not the same as drinking a, a glass of ice tea on your freezing, uh, you know, ice-coated deck in the winter. Right? It's just not the same. It, and, it, and this may account for it. Ice in summer is more valuable simply because you can put it to uses that you can't put it to in the winter time. You can. You know, you know, wipe your forehead with it when you're sweating and things like this. So you just can't do this in the winter. <laughs> or, of course, it may be that it's just an, an economizing problem, as we suggested before, right? Maybe the value of the end is the same. I mean, the, uh, the circumstances of the action are the same. Maybe he's just drinking a cup of iced tea at lunch inside his air-conditioned house in the summer or in his heated house in the winter, and so the, the circumstances aren't uh, different. But that he just, he just enjoys it more in the summer. Why is this, why can't, you know, why isn't this just plausible on the face of it? I want to throw my wife's birthday party on her birthday. Why isn't this just plausible on the face of it? Why isn't it just reasonable to think that for particular people, some actions just have more value when they're done at some times and less value when they're done at others? So anyway, these would be some of the uh, uh, answers uh, that Mises would uh, give to, uh, to the claim of exceptions. And then there's one other uh, type of exception that he deals with. This is the case of the miser. So sometimes it's claimed by some that a miser contradicts time preference. He's always hoarding and storing up and uh, you know, aiming at uh, uh, the future consumption, uh, you know, never present. Uh, but as Mises points out, he still does consume in the present. If he doesn't consume in the present, well, he's no longer a problem. Right? He sort of passes away. <clears throat> But as long as he stays alive, he's consuming in the present. He, he has low time preference, but not zero or you know, negative time preference. So he doesn't really represent a true, uh, a true uh, exception. Okay, now the next thing to uh, 
to uh, point out about uh, time is the uh, its connection to the rate of interest, connection of time preference to the rate of interest. Uh, I don't know how much of you, uh, how much of this material you've uh, covered already. So I'll try to give a uh, somewhat more than cursory uh, discussion of this, but uh, if it's repetitious, uh, well, you can just stop me, I guess, if <laughs> you heard this before. Uh, anyway, uh, time preference, would, we would uh, argue, then would be uh, manifested in what uh, Mises calls originary interest. Originary interest, then, is the uh, premium that people place upon the present, or saying, saying this differently uh, in different words, it would be the discount of the future. Right? If sooner is always preferred to later, then it would be possible to uh, have some uh, uh, determination of the extent to which the present satisfaction is more valued, the premium on the present, or the extent to which the future satisfaction is less valued, uh, the discount of the future. So this is the notion of originary interest. Time preference seems to be the uh, cause, of uh, fundamental cause of interest. Now, this interest, uh, this uh, rate of interest, though, will always be manifested in uh, monetary terms. This is a monetary rate of interest. Because the rate of interest, at least uh, as we conceive of the uh, market rate of interest, the market rate of interest would be a rate of exchange, right? an in intertemporal rate of exchange. It would be the exchange of present goods for future goods, or present money for future money. Now, notice that this presents something of a difficulty, presents this particular difficulty. We said before that any particular consumer good, let's say a birthday cake that I want to give to my wife, uh, I might have a, a intertemporal value for that is based upon economizing. I might value the cake on my wife's birthday more than I value it today. Right? So if I were intertemporally exchanging cakes, it might not be manifested in a positive rate of interest. Because there, with goods, I'm allocating the goods toward the attainment of particular ends. And these particular ends, I might value more highly in the future than in the present. And so the originary rate of interest wouldn't manifest it itself there, right? Not necessarily, at least. My time preference would have to be pretty strong for it to manifest itself, to overcome this extra future value that I would have because using the cake on that day is more valuable. But this is not true of money. This is not true of money. Money is the general medium of exchange. And so I can exchange money any time I want in the present for any, any good, any factor, and so on. And so all of my economizing activity would be taken care of by the, by the use of money. Money would wash this factor out, right? And so when we exchange money intertemporally, the only thing that's left to determine the exchange between the two, or the fundamental, there are other things too, but and we won't go into that, I, we've had a lecture on interest already. The, the time factor, this time preference factor, would remain. The economizing factor would be washed out. In other words, I might do this for my wife's birthday. I might not want to uh, acquire a cake on the day that I get home, August 9th. But it, and, and then have to you know, store it and uh, you know, keep it uh, hidden and so on until the day of her birthday. I'd rather have somebody just deliver it on that day, or pick it up, or you know, have it made and pick it up, or whatever. I wouldn't dare try to bake it myself. So, we we'll just somebody bake it, and I would pick it up on that day. That I prefer. I prefer the future good on August 9th. I prefer prefer the, the good in the future. <laughs> but I would. But this would not be true of money, right? I, I would not prefer to have the future, uh, the the sum of money in the future, you know, not nine days into the future, than to have it in my hand today. I would not. Because money is a general medium of exchange that I can use to buy things today. I could invest it today and earn the rate of interest, for example, and then cash it out because I can, because I can, you know, it's perfectly liquid, so to speak. I could just cash it out on the day that I need it and then use it to buy the good that I want. And so my intertemporal exchange doesn't depend upon the value, you know, the differing value that I place on any particular end that I wish to pursue in the present or the future. And so this is why originary interest is only manifested in a monetary economy, only through the rate of interest. Uh, we only see in the rate of interest this uh, time preference factor when we have money. Uh, otherwise, we have a mixed case. Again, we can't separate out what's a monetary element. I mean, uh, without money, we can't separate out what's the time preference element from what is an economizing or other factor that might uh, influence the value, intertemporal value of the good. Okay, so we see that time preference then is the basis for the market rate of interest. Uh, 
this would then be determined in the time market, as we would call it, the exchange of uh, present money for uh, future money. This exchange would be based, just as all exchanges, on reverse preferences, on a, on a difference uh, in preference ranking uh, that exists. This is, of course, a particular sort of difference in uh, ranking. It's a difference in the uh, degree or, or uh, intensity of time preference. So we have one person, for example, let's say, who's willing to exchange $1,000 today to get 1100 a year from today, we're going to make that exchange either way. We have another person who's willing to, uh, let's say, uh, make an exchange at 1000 present dollars for 1200 a year from today. We have a higher time preference person, larger premium on the present. We have a lower time preference person, a smaller premium on the present. And so there's room for mutually advantageous trade, right? They could trade at $150 premium. We could trade at 100, uh, you know, 15 uh, at this uh, rate uh, of $150 over a thousand. <laughs> and so, just like in any market, then people would, come, you know, we'd have the market clearing price. We'd have demand and supply determined uh, on both sides of the market by time preference. Just like in any market, the Austrians argue that demand and supply are uh, determined by preference for the good and money in exchange. Right, the price is determined by preferences through demand and supply. And then all the factors that affect our preferences for goods, uh, uh, or all the circumstances that, that affect uh, our preferences, filter through our mental judgments, right? We, we, we judge the value of all of these external circumstances, and then that affects our action, and that affects the price. So the same with this argument. That all the other factors that uh, influence the rate of interest would do so through time preference, through our judgment of the value of sooner as opposed to later. This at least is how the argument uh, runs. And then of course there are two different components to the time market. We can break it down, this is uh, from Rothbard, uh, into the credit market where there's a credit transaction. Right? The credit transaction is one that's not consummated until the future. So this is just a standard uh, lending and borrowing contract. Right? So you take out a mortgage but the contract isn't fulfilled until 20 years later when you pay the last payment. And the credit market then is further subdivided into consumer loans where the money borrowed goes to buy consumer goods and producer loans where the borrowed money goes to purchase capital goods. Then the other component of the uh, time market, which is more important, in the, at least in an advanced economy it's more important, is the uh, structure of production, the capital structure. And here it's the entrepreneurs, or the capitalist entrepreneurs if you will, who lend money to the owners of the factors of production. They pay them their wages and so on sooner. Then after some time the good is produced and the good is sold for uh, money to the consumer and the capitalist entrepreneur recoups uh, those, uh, those costs. <clears throat> and so uh, th there's a discount, right? The uh, value of what's produced that accrues to each uh, factor member, his marginal revenue product, is then discounted uh, uh, for the factor price that would be paid by the capitalist entrepreneur. So that the capitalist entrepreneur earns the rate of interest in the production process. Right? He must do this otherwise, because of his time preference, he would never, you know, let's say, buy factors of production today and pay uh, $50,000 just to produce a product that he could sell in six months for $50,000. He would never intentionally do that. He would always, because he's paying present money to get future money, he would always uh, uh, require a, an interest the payment. So this is where we get the notion, of course, that the wages and other factor prices are uh, uh, based upon the discounted marginal revenue product of the factor. And let me just give you a quick uh, numeric example because we want to see how this relates to the uh, uncertainty that case in a minute. And uh, Mises calls this uh, gross profit. This is what we call before net income. These are interchangeable terms. <coughs> and uh, this particular case, let's say we have a production process that takes a capital good, natural resource, and a labor factor. And the marginal revenue products to be realized in one year from these factors are $10,000 for the capital good, five for the uh, natural resource, 2,500 for the labor. Okay, so th these would be uh, this, the sum of these would be the selling price of the output. 
in gross profit, this would be the revenue that was earned when the output was sold. Okay, we're, we're assuming uh, no entrepreneurial profit here. <laughs> okay, then let's say that the rate of interest, the, the uh, originary rate of interest is 25% of uh, the annual uh, rate of interest. So the question is then, what, what would the capitalist entrepreneur pay today to get this amount of revenue or each of these factors uh, to uh, buy them uh, today to get this amount of revenue one year from today at a 25% uh, originary rate of interest. So this gives us then the discounted marginal revenue products. Where we would just discount, right? We just uh, net out 25% of these values. So we'd get 8,000, uh, 4,000. 2000. So it's this sum that the entrepreneur would uh, pay. And this would show up then in his net income. It would show up in his gross profit. This $3,500 part of his net income would actually be interest. And notice the $3,500 divided by the 14 would be his rate of interest, rate of return, right? And this conforms to the interest rate. This is the 25% rate. Again, if this weren't the case, then people would, you know, the entrepreneurs, other entrepreneurs would rush in and capitalists would rush in to get this extra profit. They'd bid up the factor prices and equalize this rate of return. Okay, so this is how, uh, this, this is the main way in which the originary interest would manifest itself in the economy. Not so much through the credit market, although that's important, but through the structure of production. Okay, now let's quickly turn to the uncertainty part and uh, we mentioned a few uh, key things here. Um, <coughs> When we talk about the uncertainty of the future, we're saying that the future is somewhat predictable. Okay, it's not perfectly predictable and it's not completely unpredictable. It's just somewhat predictable. That's what we mean by uncertainty. Now, this seems to be a necessary feature of human existence. In other words, human action seems to, of necessity, imply that the future is uncertain. Because if, it were, if the future were perfectly predictable, we would have no choice of ends. If we knew exactly how all of our actions would work out, there would be no, no choice, right? There would be no ends that we would pursue. Uh, and, if, and if the future were completely unpredictable, there would be no means. We wouldn't be able to identify what in nature was a suitable means to the attainment of an end. If, if employing it in any particular action could have any result, right? Now, it would seem then that the sources of uncertainty, as I suggested before, would be just human nature, human finitude. We're, we're finite beings. Whereas the natural world and other human beings in the natural world change. So, so we, have, we have changeable circumstances and a finite ability to comprehend these changes. That seems to be why uh, the future is uncertain. And with respect to these circumstances, we can, Mises nicely divides these up into two different uh, basic categories. He says some things that we need to predict, some things that can change and therefore that we need to predict, um, would, be the working, would be the working out of the causal laws of nature. We're not sure about these, right? Sometimes we're just, we're just mistaken or even when we have the right theory, it uh, doesn't work out the way we think because of intervening circumstances or something. And here he points out there are two cases, right? So when we talk about predicting the future, one aspect of predicting you know, how our actions will turn out in the future is to predict the working of these causal laws. And there are two different types of causal laws. He's, th he's talking now about in nature, natural laws, physics and so on, engineering principles. So he says there's, scientific, there's the, the realm of scientific prediction. This is where we have natural laws, physics, engineering, chemistry and so on. And we presume then to know the exact quantitative relationship between the cause and the effect. And we make a prediction based upon that. Right? We build a bridge and we predict it won't fall down. We uh, shoot a space shuttle into the sky and predict it won't burn up. You know, sometimes these predictions don't work out. But, but, w but we, c we have a basis upon which to make the prediction. The basis is this causal law, as well as we can comprehend it. But sometimes it, we don't do so perfectly. Then the second type here are statistical predictions. Sometimes the, the, our, the causal laws are statistical in nature. This is what Mises calls class probability. 
Sometimes we know, in other words, or at least we can presume to know, everything about a whole class of events. But nothing about each event except that it's a member of the class. Let's say hurricanes, the natural phenomena. And we know everything about the class, right? Well, we can presume to know everything about the class. We know every hurricane that comes and hits the U.S. We've kept records all this time, we, and we, so we, have, we, we know everything about the whole class, right? And if, this, if it happens to be that there's some sort of numeric statement that we can make about the probability of hurricanes, maybe that's true, maybe it isn't, but that's part of class probability. So if it's true that there's some sort of numeric fixity to these hurricanes, we get, let's say, the mean number of hurricanes that we get is five a year. Or the, or the, or the average amount of damage is, is a, a billion dollars or something like this. Then we can use this for uh, statistical prediction. We can use this knowledge for statistical prediction. We don't know this perfectly, right? That's why we have to predict. But we have some numeric basis of making a prediction. Now, there are two types of predictions that we can make here. One is that we can make a prediction about the whole class of events. Right? We could do this. Maybe we, we'd be in a position to do this. Uh, an insurance company would have to do this, right? They would have to make a prediction about the entire class of events. How many, in other words, in the past we've had five hurricanes a year, billion dollars damage each. If we suppose that this a pattern you know, is intact, it's a class probability a principle, then let's, you know, if we're going to insure against hurricanes, we have to expect $5 billion a year for 100 years or whatever. Right? That's, that's just a scientific prediction. They're just using the knowledge of the class probability that they know to make a scientific prediction. They might be wrong about this. The other case would be where we're just trying to predict one event. We're just trying to predict, you know, will a hurricane hit on uh, September 1st? Will it hit Miami or something? Here, of course, it's entirely different. This sort of prediction is, uh, is subjecting ourselves to risk. This is what Mises calls gambling. Right? And all gambling games are like this. Right? One event that we're trying to predict within a class of events where we know something about the class. So we're not sure in these cases. And then, and then the other type, separate from uh, causal laws of nature that we're somewhat unsure about, would be uh, the results of human action. Human choice itself, in other words, when we're trying to predict human choice. And Mises says, here we have an entirely different category. Right? We don't have scientific principles we or uh, scientific causal laws. We don't have statistical laws. Here, all we can do is engage in what he calls thymological prediction. <coughs> Thymology, or specific understanding, he calls this. And we spoke about this uh, yesterday briefly, this specific understanding, this discipline of history, <coughs> the blending of uh, theoretical knowledge and historical evidence blending together these things into a composite kind of uh, conceptual framework that we can use to predict. And in a classic illustration of this that Mises gives is a, uh, we have an acquaintance and we want to we want to be able to predict what this acquaintance will do, how he'll react to a joke that we tell or you know what he'll think if we give him a Christmas present or because this will improve our own actions, right? We'll know, yes, I should tell the joke or no, I shouldn't or yes, I should you know give his wife a uh, uh, birthday card, or I know I shouldn't do that. Uh, but in order to predict this, I have to know something about his character. Or, or we can just summarize my knowledge as knowing about his character. And I can only know about this through experience, through, through real human experience, through real historical events, right? I just take my theoretical notions and I blend them with the experience that I have of this guy. And I come up with phimological prediction. I say this guy, you know, he's a pretty funny guy, and so he'll laugh at this joke, or he wouldn't be offended if I gave his wife, uh, you know, I've known before they got married, a, you know, a birthday card, or yes, he would, because I know he's this kind of guy, and so on. So it's this kind of thing, right? We're not sure about this. There's uncertainty in the world because even though we can have some predictive uh, ability, we're, we're not perfectly sure. <laughs> okay, now, as I suggested before, of course, this... This uncertainty implies error. Sometimes we make errors when we predict. The error would be the difference between the predicted and actual outcome. 
And this error, of course, could be of two types. We could predict uh, the outcome of an event where the event turns out better than we predicted. We invest money in a stock uh, and we think, uh, you know, we buy at 50 and we uh, anticipate the price is going to double to 100 in six months and in six months it's, uh, it's at 150. We made a mistake, right? We made, a, we made an error in our prediction. And we for, we, we've foregone now an opportunity for gain, right? That's why this is an error. The error implies that we've sacrificed something. Something's been given up. And what's been given up is the opportunity to have better invested. Right? I could have invested more or I could have invested differently across different investment activities had I better predicted. And then the other type of error, of course, would be a negative error where the future turns out worse than I predict. And the loss involved in that is obvious. <laughs> now, let me just give you one last, uh, I said I wanted to finish up this and uh, this example. Let me give you one last uh, case of uh, how these two blend together, uh, the uncertainty element, the entrepreneurial predicting foresight element, uh, and the uh, time preference element. Remember, in this particular case, we weren't concerning ourselves with the, uh, with the prediction that was made. We just sort of assumed that these marginal revenue products would be realized in the future. But we know that's not the case, right? They have to be predicted. All, all that the entrepreneur knows actually today are the actual prices of these factors of production, which are discounted marginal revenue products. He knows this, right? These factor prices existed yesterday and he knows what they are. He doesn't know what the future selling prices of the output will be. He has to predict this. And profit accrues to him when he predicts this better than, more accurately than other entrepreneurs. Let's say, for example, that he has this let's call this uh, anticipated marginal revenue product. Of these three factors, looks like this. So while, while other entrepreneurs in the market, based upon what they're willing to pay these factors, are expecting these marginal revenue products, he anticipates that his own production process will give him these higher marginal revenue products. These, again, are anticipated marginal revenue products. So let's say they look like this, uh, so that the total that would be uh, accruing here is 19250 And let's say that this works out. He buys these factors, pays the 14000 and then when it comes time to sell the good, he realizes 19250 This is because of his superior foresight, right? All the other entrepreneurs were anticipating just 1750 but he drew these factors away into a more valuable production process by better anticipating uh, what consumers would pay. So now his gross profit will have these two components, right? It will be uh, the 19,250 uh, minus the 14, or 5,250. And notice he'll be able, to, he's able to use the market to decompose this. He knows that these are mixed together, his foresight and his uh, interest, his uh, profit uh, proper and his interest. And he can use the uh, credit markets to disentangle this. He can just figure out, in other words, what his interest uh, return, what his interest payment should be or what, what, it, what he would estimate it to be in this investment. He can say, oh, the going rate of interest uh, is whatever, 25% in our example. And so he's still earning 3500 for interest. But now he's able to, to net that out, right? He gets 5,250 in gross profit. He nets out the interest, and there's the residual, his profit, $1,750. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'll uh, stop there. I knew I wouldn't uh, finish, <laughs> and I didn't. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.